This week, we have another one from the vault. Yes, it has been there a while. It has, and it's a rare one. It's, it's special. Yes, and we, we talk about that, mm-hmm. um, why it's rare. Yes. And I uh, love this movie. I know you do. <laughs> I think it's a very charming movie. I think it is. Uh, there's a lot to say about it. And, uh, you know, the, the the biggest part about it, I think we cover pretty well mm-hmm. on what it is. Uh, we introduce a new term. Yes. Yeah. See how that goes. Well, what it's going to catch on like wildfire. And pretty soon we'll see it all over social media. Uh, I love your positivity. Yeah. <laughs> but uh you know it's one of those could watch a million times and will watch a million more times because we have it yeah we do physical media baby <laughs> um yeah i think we should jump into this yeah we don't need to spend so much time on foreplay let's just let's just get to it yeah <laughs> all right let's go Welcome to Bravo for the B-Side. This is Danny, your hopeless romantic. And this is Jim. Just Jim? Uh, yeah. Uh, hopeless romantic, hey? Yeah. What? I don't know. I just, I don't know. I, there's something about the term hopeless romantic. Like hopeless. I don't know. Yeah. It's a thing. It is a thing. Anyway. Well. So. We have a movie today. We do. We have one every week. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind I of mean, a thing. Well, you know. This one, some, so, okay. Uh, sometimes we have interviews. I just That's want to make true. that clear. I mean, we do watch movies on the weeks that we have interviews. Yeah. We watch movies all the time. That's kind of what we do. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. I have some disclaimers about this movie. Okay. Okay. First of all. You will not find this movie on any streaming service. Uh, none that we are aware of. And it was a long, hard look. Secondly, mm-hmm. this movie is not currently in print. No. So we've picked a movie that you probably have no fucking chance of ever seeing. Unfortunately. <laughs> But they're out there. I'm sure, like, used DVD stores, you could surely, maybe somewhere, maybe it's at the last blockbuster. Maybe. In Bend, Oregon. Yeah. We (laughs) have a DVD of this film because it is a film that you really love and that I had not seen. And then for a birthday or something some time ago, I... I had had this on my list and I went out and I, I, uh, well, by went out, I mean, I went on the internet. I went out on the internet <laughs> <clears throat> looking and looking and looking and finally found it for a somewhat embarrassing amount of money, honestly, and got it for you. You did. <laughs> it was, um, it was either a birthday or Father's Day. Something. Yeah. But I was astounded. When you got it, not an easy find. No, because they are not. They're it's not not in print, as I said. So, I mean, it's not like you can go and get it new anywhere. Right. Well, and I remember when we were talking about it one time, and I so I started looking for it. So I'm like, oh, let's just grab this. I think you're gonna like this. And shit, couldn't find it. I think I found one that showed up on the search on eBay. Yeah. And they wanted like a hundred and something bucks. I'm like, Mm -hmm. oh, I guess you're not gonna see this. I think I found it. For like sixty dollars, I'm okay with that because <laughs> I love this movie. Yeah, it's awesome. Um, let's see, anything going on this week? Not really. Um, that has up, gone on. Upcoming. Well, upcoming. Mm. 
Yeah. Mm. Um, upcoming is a lot of disruption. Yes. Yes. So, yeah, someone. It's be a tough week. Yeah. Someone in the building has a little pest issue. Yep. So they're doing a prophylactic spray. Of every apartment. Of every apartment. And fuck. We have to yeah. pull everything out of every kitchen cupboard. We have to pull everything out of every closet. We have to. We have an enormous amount of shit. Yeah. Yeah. This is it's going to be. So two full days of just nightmare. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but on the upside, by the time this episode comes out, our little YouTube channel project should be live. Yeah. Do you want to say anything about that? I don't. Not until it's live. Oh. Yeah. Well, by the time this comes out, it will be live. Maybe. What if something happens? See, then I've given misinformation. Oh, my gosh. Fine. So, upcoming, we have a channel called Observations of Earth with B.F. McGillicuddy. And it's just, you know, some short little five-minute bits about... Uh, what would a visitor to this planet think of some of the shit going on here? Yeah. So, yeah, we've got, I've got, we did three episodes. So well, we you say get... we, but I've helped relatively minimally. This has been your <laughs> baby. Well, you helped set up, helped set up the green screen, helped set up the lights. Yeah, I've helped mechanically. And, and, and that's you hit record it. and then you hit stop. Mm-hmm. And then you hit record. Yeah. And you, you know. do everything else. Uh, well, anyway, it's still us. You're still listed as executive producer. Aw. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so, yeah, it's just uh, little five-minute bits uh, about, like I said, things going on on Earth. What would it be like for someone, you know, intelligent life, to come fly by and be like, huh, let's take a look at this. Um, we'll see how it goes. So, yeah, I got three you got to have those magic three. Otherwise, you don't have a channel. Mm. So that'll be, I just got those up today. And then um, this week, nothing will happen. It just won't. And then starting next week, though, weekly little episodes on random things. And that's pretty much it. It's fun. Yeah. You know. Um, yeah. I think that's all I'm going to say about it. You've worked extremely hard on it. Uh, yeah, (laughs) I kind of have. Well, you know, learning a few things and playing with things I haven't necessarily had to play with. Yeah. Other projects. So. I think you're having fun with it. Oh, I am. And, you know, more than anything, it just, it's my bitch box. Yes. (laughs) It's going to be some things that I myself have. As as a resident of this planet, have walked around, looked at, and be like, "Huh." It's like, what's getting Jim's goat this week? Yeah, well, it's not always. <laughs> it's not always what's getting my goat. Like the next one coming up, I have a, a fun idea. Oh, well, because you know, there's a lot of things that go on on this planet that, if even we, as if we look at it for like the first or even second time, it's like, um, mm. well, so now I'm going to take that to the next level and. What would a visitor think of all this? So I think that's really all that's going on. We got some D and D going, which was awesome. Oh, thank you. Uh, watching the the clock tick down on lockdown because mm. it's coming. It's coming. It will happen. <laughs> Rest assured, it's still spiraling. But what do you do? You just roll with it. You just roll with it. Yeah. Well, look. This is a B-movie dissection and lessons learned podcast. Yeah, it is. So why don't you tell us a little bit about the movie that we're watching this week? This week, we are talking about The Tall Guy. The Tall Guy. Yes. Uh, It's from 1989, last of the 80s films. I was two. Yep. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, directed by Mel Smith, written by Richard Curtis, starring Jeff Goldblum, Rowan Atkinson, Emma Thompson, Geraldine James. And more. And, and yeah, and <laughs> considerably more. Um, but let's, 
let's just be 100% honest. Jeff Goldblum sold. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know? I mean, he just has to be listed. And I'm like, yeah. Yeah. I'll and watch that, was, it. that was the thing for me. You know, like, what is this? <gasps> Jeff Goldblum, I'm going to go see it. And I did. Still love it. Uh, rated R. Mm hmm. The logline for this monster is a nasty comedian's assistant has allergy-induced sneezes, giving problems at work, etc. He accepts weekly injections after seeing the cute nurse. After a dozen injections, he finally asks her out. Uh, there's a little more to it than that. It's not a great logline, but um, it's a good movie. It is. Um, so a couple things about this before we begin. Yes. Uh, number one, this is a UK film. All right. Number two, the reason they got Jeff Goldblum is because at that time in the U.S., it was the actor strike. Yeah. So he had a full calendar open. So they they got him to do it. All the better. Um, we do mention as we go through this, we might as well just start with it because it comes up like a couple times. Um, hold on. I have... You have a glasses strap thing, Hammy. I have all kinds of stuff. I, I wore in a collared shirt today, which is not usually what I do. Anyway, so yeah, I'm hearing this in my ear. Mm. It's driving me mad. Anyway, UK film. So this is like 100% UK humor. Yes. Um, yeah, Jeff Goldblum. It's like the only American element. Mm -hmm. and But it's great. Also, this thing floated around for about a year before it showed up over here. So it had a pretty big ride. However, the global earnings <laughs> were about 500000 That was it. Yeah. Which is, uh, you know, for an indie film, that would be phenomenal. For a, a B movie, B movie with this kind of talent, um, yeah, I don't know. And we didn't dive into all the distro stuff, so I'm not sure what kind of actual distribution it had. Just that it took the slow boat over here to get over here for quite a while. Yeah, yeah. Well, so why don't you bring us into this bad boy? Okay. Well, okay. <clears throat> Let me get myself set up. Okay. Okay, I'm ready. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> um, so we see a man, uh, Jeff Goldblum. He's preparing for a show. He's like in front of the mirror in the green room. He's talking to himself in his head. Um, mostly it's about how he's like dissatisfied with what he's doing. Right. <laughs> And then he goes on stage to introduce somebody else. Yep. Um, and so you're like, oh, okay. So he's um, he's the assistant in the show, and he's not particularly famous, and he's not the focus of the show. No. Uh, and he mostly, throughout the show, gets beat up by the main performer, who is played by Rowan Atkinson. Yes. Uh, and Rowan Atkinson's freaking hilarious. Oh, he's he's... He's, well, it's funny. He's he's funny in the bits that he does, and he's funny throughout the film. Yeah. But he's he's a very straight. Because most of what we see of him is not the show. Right. It's a little bit of a spoiler. But yeah, he's, you know, he's, he's, uh, he does well. But as we find out, we'll see. So as Jeff's character is leaving the show, he's about to go out the back door and there's this like crowd of paparazzi out there. Yeah. And they cheer when the door opens and then he walks out and they're like, oh. Yeah. They just sort of like, oh, oh. It's, okay, never mind. It's not him. <laughs> um, and he <laughs> has a bike parked in front of the theater and that's his ride. So he hops on it and he's riding his bike and he's like, also constantly sneezing and blowing his nose Yes, as he goes along. At one point, he reaches into his jacket pocket and, like, pulls out just, like, a bunch of wads of Kleenexes. 
Uh, and I really like the intro to this character in this movie because we learn an enormous amount about him through his little voiceover, his talking to himself. Right. And he gets home and we learn a lot more about his home life. Uh, he lives with a woman who's also his landlady and she's always got strange men over. Yeah. As roommates, they're as, not together. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But she's always got like her boyfriends over. So he regularly walks home and like, or gets home and there's like a naked man wandering through his apartment. Yes. <laughs> and it's very casual. <laughs> Uh, did you did you get the bit where he meets the, we meet him with the first one? No. So uh, well, uh, Goldblum's character is named Dexter. Mm -hmm. So Dexter he comes home. There's this naked guy. He's sitting and he flips on the TV. He sees his boss, uh, Ron Atkinson, who's Ron Anderson. Yes, the comedian uh, on TV and stuff. So anyway, the nude guy just kind of comes out. And uh, the roommate introduces him and then Dexter sneezes on his dick. Oh, yeah. Because the guy's just, he's sitting and the guy is just he's right there. Right in his face. Yep. And then, <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, man. Oh. Uh, he checks his messages and his answering machine isn't working quite right. So it's this guy, his agent, I'm guessing, yeah. who is addressing him as Dexter. And uh, he has to leave like multiple messages because the machine keeps cutting him off. And then his landlady, whose name is Carmen, comes down and her naked companion, still naked. Mm -hmm. They both sit down and just start talking with him. <laughs> and it's just like a friendly chat. It's not, you know, like we have to talk about something. It's just like regular, you know, conversational kind of stuff. Uh, Dexter has a lot of allergies. She says that he's allergic to everything. Yes. And uh, we also learn about his kind of past string of girlfriends. Yeah. Uh, who are the, all very interesting characters. The failure train. Yeah. As it were. Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> uh, so a bit later, he we see him going to the doctor about his allergies. and. Um, this was funny because there's a guest doctor there who is a psychiatrist or psychologist. Right. Um, and he just, he, he, he has the physical look of somebody you just don't want to bank on for getting you through anything. If I walked in somewhere and that guy came in and, and was the doctor, I would be like, huh. He looks like he missed his last Thorazine drip. Yeah. I would just go AMA <laughs> and walk out. Uh, but when they, uh, the doctor is talking about what she can do and she mentions, mentions injections, uh, and he starts to kind of freak and he, he, he hates needles. Doesn't like them. Right. Um, and then of course the psychologist says, Oh, I'd love to talk to you about this needle phobia. And I love Dexter's very point blank. It's not a phobia. I just fucking hate them. <laughs> uh, so he gets pills for his, for his, uh, prescription for allergy stuff. Um, and this is when he's walking out, he spots a nurse uh, pushing an older fellow in a wheelchair. And she's Ma making train noises. Making train sounds. <laughs> and just kind of back and forth in the hall, or out side to side in the hall. Having hallway. fun. Yeah. And then, like any good 80s film, the music cues in. And with his look and that music, we can tell this is the one. Yeah. He's smitten. So he goes, back in the doctor's office to get injections instead so he can see the nurse. Right. Well, because as she's coming down, she kind of pokes her head in the door that he just came out of, and he learns that she would have been the one to give him the shots. Right. And then he's like, I think I want the shots. Yeah. Uh, so uh, at home, uh, he tells his roommate that he's fallen in love, and her name's Carmen. We did that. Mm -hmm. uh, the next day, he rides his bike back to the hospital uh, inside, the nurse is ready to give him the shot. And, you know, he's pretty brave when it happens. And when it's done, she leaves. And at home, he details his failed attempt at asking her out to yeah. Carmen. Like, whoosh, 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 and she's gone. Like, uh, the next week, it's another shot. He doesn't do as well. 
Uh, she ends up leaving before he can say anything again. And then we get to another week. Uh, and then he tries to use uh, Ron Anderson's name as a name drop. Do you know who Ron Anderson is? She's like, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and then I love this. We get in his head, this little imaginary scene. There's surgeons on a body. And they're working like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Nah, nah, nah. And um, <laughs> one guy's like, this man has no spine. Yeah. And they kind of chorus in, he's spineless. So there's Dexter for you. Now, I got to say this. Dexter has the best pajamas. Oh, they are Superman pajamas. A onesie. A onesie. I love those pajamas. Oh, I think those are the greatest fucking thing ever. So we see him in those. Um, one morning he's talking to Carmen. He's decided to lie to say he's going to Morocco because he knows there's all kinds of shots involved. Well, because he's out of the allergy. Out shots. of the allergy shots. Yeah. So now he's got, he's got, he's like, there's tw- like 12 shots. So he's got all these chances to make this happen. Okay, cool. So he gets to the hospital and the nurse says they can do all the shots at once. Yeah. There's like a polio thing. It's a little, you know, squirt in the mouth. And then there's one pill for one thing and the rest are all like this big cocktail. So uh, he doesn't know what to do. Uh, He finally asks her name. Her name is Kate. And just as he's about to have a spine, she gets called off to an emergency. Yeah. And then the psychologist comes in to take her place to do the shots. And Jesus Christ, the face. <laughs> oh, the, the psychologist, is, he's like, oh, we're going to do this one without looking. He looks away and just pokes him. And Dexter's just like. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the whole scene is very British. Oh, yeah. In its humor, which, you know, we just love. Yeah. I mean, it is, it's tough to kind of capture the nature of, and the hilarity of these scenes in notes oh yeah we've mentioned it a couple times we've done comedies and it's just like you can't you can't hit the notes sitting here talking about it but yeah it was it was awesome um so i mean on his show it's affecting him at work too ron is threatening to fire dexter if he can't sort out whatever it is that's bothering him yeah so then we see that Dexter has kind of like given up and he's on a date with one of his previous girlfriends and he is not very about it. No. Um, and she's obnoxious. Well, she is. And you can tell this is one of those. Uh, I just, you know, I just don't know what to do. Mm-hmm. There's nothing happening. I blew it with this woman, the nurse. It's like that. I can't. There's no, no reason to go back now. So shit. So, you know, um, a lot of movies are based on this. You go through your old address book of failures and, <laughs> and he picked this one and, oh, is, is she a joy? She's a gem. Yeah. So he escapes into the bathroom to take a minute for himself, like hitting his head on the wall. And it's this very cute little scene. He finally puts himself together. Buys a condom out of the bathroom machine. Yeah. And then on his way out, who does he run into but Kate, the yeah. nurse? Yep. Yeah. All alone. All alone. Uh, and she's headed, you know, to the bathroom. So he frantically tries to get the girl like that he's on the date with to leave. Before Kate comes back out, but is unsuccessful in that because she does come back out. Yep. Uh, and she remembers him, which is interesting. Yes. She always kind of acted like this is, you know, just all business, you know. Well, it's just another day on the job. Yeah. Yeah. And talking with him for a moment, she brings up Morocco because that was what he was supposedly getting the shots for. Yes. And he is like mortified that she's seen him out on a date. <laughs> so he they leave and he's walking with the girl and she's just like this girl is just spilling her heart out to him yeah um it, in a in a way that makes you go oh 
<laughs> Dexter, what are you doing, man? Yeah. And he just abandons her. He just literally like turns and runs away and goes straight to the hospital looking for Kate. Now, I just, I put in my notes. Mm-hmm. Um, so he finds Kate, but I wrote, never mind. She got there magically fast. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> it's one of those little things that he, she was just sitting down to eat. They were leaving. They're walking in the park somewhere in that when he just like stops, turns around and leaves this woman in the park, like mid sentence. So it's sprinting back. Right. Kate has not only ate dinner, but managed to get to the hospital, change into her uniform and hit the floor and become heavily engrossed in work. Yeah. But shh. Yeah. We don't talk about such things. <laughs> so he finds her, asks her out. Um, she agrees. And then she calls him out on Morocco. Mm-hmm. A couple things here that I liked. One. She's a no bullshit kind of person. She is very no nonsense. Yeah, absolutely. Just completely direct. Yeah. You know, Um, and she's extremely observant. But Mm -hmm. here again, she remembered him about Morocco and she knew it was bullshit the whole time. Oh, yeah. Just let him ride with it. So you get the sense that uh, she's got an eye to him. Oh, yeah. This is good. Maybe maybe Dexter won't you know, had another page in his book of failures. <laughs> so this changes him dramatically in terms of his attitude. Oh yeah. He's been like his voiceovers and stuff is he's been very kind of humdrum. Like this is my life. And you know, I, uh, and you can imagine Jeff Goldblum the way he does this stuff with his voice, you know, uh, but the next night Dexter changes up the show. Yeah. Stealing a scene from Ron. Now, afterwards, Ron gives him a huge bucket of shit. And it's funny because, like, you see Dexter's in the shower in his little dressing room. And Ron just storms in, throws the curtain back, and just starts laying into him. Right. Well, this man's wet and naked. <laughs> <laughs> wet and naked. <laughs> you know, what a classy guy. Mm-hmm. Um, so Dexter uh, meets Kay outside the hospital, or Kate outside the hospital. She says she's tired. Well, yeah, when he meets her, she's sleeping. Yeah. Leaning against a lamppost. Uh, yeah, because she's, you know, it's she's a nurse yeah. in a very busy hospital, so you can kind of get it. Uh, she's not up for dinner. Um, then she asks if he's going to walk her home or not. And then we get to walk with him, of course. And there's well, some... I like how she does it because she's like, so are you going to walk me home or should I just get murdered on my own? Yeah. <laughs> When they get back to her place, uh, they have this very offbeat talk about sex, you know, about the whole, it, I don't even want to get into it. I, you need to see it, folks. It's it's pretty clever the way it's, sure. it's worded and just her attitude towards it. But in the end, she's up for it, but not because she's just drag ass tired, but she does say she's off the next day and he should come by. So clearly she likes him. And then we cue the triumphant music, and then we have Dexter flitting through the park, and we have a giant full moon in the backdrop, and we see Dexter doing a cartwheel in front of the moon, and then another one on the way back, and some backflips and stuff. Yeah, it's fun. (laughs) Uh, So the next day, he meets her in her house and learns that orange is her favorite color. Like, everything is orange. This is an orange apartment. Yes. Yes. It's very bright. Very bright. Yeah. And they get busy. Uh, And it is an amusing scene. A couple of kind of highlights, like the feathers in her duvet set off his allergies. So she just takes the whole comforter and throws it out the window. Yes. Yeah. They destroy her apartment. Yeah, they do. (laughs) (laughs) And he ends up missing the show because he is so caught up in being with her. So at the show, there's another guy in his place, and this guy is being much funnier than Ron. And Ron is not happy about it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and that guy is Charlie, who's like a stagehand. Yeah. So after the show, Ron has had enough. He fires them both. So when 
uh, when Dexter tells Kate about this, she's very sympathetic. And then together they destroy Ron's billboard. Yeah. Oh, well, they vandalize it. Well, yeah, we get this, this montage. Yeah. The eighties montage. Oh yeah. And that's why I was saying 89. It's like one of the last of the eighties movies. Mm -hmm. Um, this has the flavor of the like early nineties rom coms though. Oh yeah. We're going to get to that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and there, there's this very, it's a cute musical montage yes. about them. They're dating mm -hmm. and it's clear this is meant to be. Well, let's, let's not forget to mention in this montage with all this great music, singing underwear. Yes. Yes. Yep. They're singing underwear. Um, I think it's in this one, but it might be toward the end of it. Yeah. I think it's toward the end of the montage when the music is kind of done and, you know, there are like little breaks kind of in it. There's one point where she finds his Superman pajamas and she's like, she's like, <laughs> if you ever wear these again, I will leave you immediately. Yeah. And there's this great argument. <laughs> like, these are, these are excellent. She's like, two people could fit in those. And oh yeah. Like, oh bullshit. And then, yep, they've got them. They're both in them. They're walking down the hall. Yeah. So we're looking through a doorway and they come across the doorway in the hall and you just hear, I told you so. <laughs> It's very cute. Yes. Um, at the end of it, she is telling him that he needs to get another job. Yeah. She's like, it's bad enough that I'm dating an actor. <laughs> I don't want to be dating an unemployed actor. Right. Um, and it's not like mean spirited the way she says it, but it's also like, you know, get, get something else to do, bud. Well, the thing with this is, her character is written this way and Emma Thompson does a great job with it, but it, it is a very British thing on being straightforward, but not to, you know, intentionally harm. It's not malicious. No. You know, like here in America, <laughs> you know, our movies are filled with people who are taking like little light comments and turning them into these disastrous soul shattering insults. Oh, I you know, know. With their tone and aggressiveness and stuff. You know, she's just very up about it. Yeah. You know, it's it's kind of refreshing. It is. I really <laughs> love her attitude and the way that she goes about things. But he goes to his agent who's not optimistic about his prospects. No. Uh, there's a couple, there's like one small scene where he's at an audition. It's just a, it's a one liner. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just awful. Uh, this is the kind of shit that he's getting sent out on where we're, you know, led to believe. Yeah. So after a while, you know, he's looking for work. Uh, his agent sends him out to this musical about the elephant man. Yes. <laughs> the notion is ridiculous and uh, it's played up pretty well. Uh, and then we learn at the rehearsals that Dexter cannot dance, nor can he sing. Right. At all. And this is a musical. It is. Uh, the director kind of bullshits him into taking the part of the elephant man, which weirdly is the lead role. Mm -hmm. But he, he doesn't speak. No. He just kind of goes, ah! <laughs> and is physically present. Um, so as the rehearsals go on, we get, you know, all these different shots of things happening. Dexter ends up talking to the female lead. Uh, and in one conversation, she's clearly hitting on him. Oh yeah. You know, we she, uh, like straight up asks if he's married. Right. And then uh, she's married too. Yeah. But you can tell there's this, there's this thing going on. Um, we eventually get to uh, one of the final rehearsals and we get treated to the closing lyrics of somewhere in heaven is an angel with big ears. Yeah. <laughs> As they're, they're singing about the death of the elephant man. Yeah. Uh, so they have, uh, cause it's like a rap for rehearsals, you know, before they go live. Yeah. They have a party, uh, the celebration uh, everyone's drinking, uh, and then Dexter, of course, ends up talking to the female lead. 
She tells him she's falling in love with him. She doesn't care that he has a girlfriend. She has a husband. And then she kisses him. And then we end up with them in the prop room and doesn't take much to figure out what goes from there. Yeah. Yeah. So that night he gets into bed with Kate and he seems (laughs) shell-shocked. I guess that's one way to put it. What what, what, what did you say? Um... Let's see. What did I say? Oh, I didn't even get into that part. Oh. I just jumped to opening night. Oh, sure. (laughs) So, yeah, the show goes on to opening night. And Kate, this is so cute. She has hitched a ride to the show in an ambulance. Yes. To get there on time from work. And she's very nearly late. She makes it. She's just in time to get seated. Ends up sitting in the balcony with Carmen. And Carmen's random man. Yeah, not nude dude. He's, not he's nude, dressed because right. they're at the, you know. Not currently nude dude. Pretty soon, though. Uh, did you write anything about the show? Um, so I wrote that during the show, Kate makes a lot of confused face, faces. Yeah, she is bewildered. And she has some pretty visceral reactions. <laughs> And I just wrote, it's it's some kind of show. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Uh, the only thing I noted about it was uh, that the point where the elephant man is revealed mm-hmm. when Dexter's hood is pulled up, uh, the makeup looks like a low-budget middle school theater job. Yes. <laughs> it's ridiculous. And when it happens, she about loses her shit. Yeah. She tries so hard not to burst into laughter. I know. My favorite part, though, is his little teeny tiny elephant trunk of a nose. Yes, they actually gave him an <laughs> elephant trunk for fucking nose. Oh my god! Oh. Yeah, you know, let's let's just move past how absolutely disrespectful that is to John Merrick, right? The, the actual elephant man in real life, folks. But you know, um, this is also a a uh, a spin on how ridiculous theater can be. That's true. So, you know, there it is. So, <laughs> but no, I didn't write anything else about the show because listeners need to watch it and experience it for themselves. Yeah. <laughs> so there's an after party for the show and a lot of fun things are happening at this after party. Uh, the director is moving on to a, a Shakespeare mm-hmm. <clears throat> production. Yeah. He's going to do Richard. Th- oh, Richard the third. And his title song is going to be, I have a hunch. Oh, yeah. I'm going to be king. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and there is at one point him and this other guy are working out the song as they're drinking, just yeah. having fun. And I'm like, oh, my fucking God. <laughs> I have a hunch. <laughs> are you right? I am. It's just I remember the way he says it, too. Yes, I do have a song. It's I have a hunch. I'm going to be king <laughs> oh god um so <sighs> at the after party dexter's old boss ron shows up late yeah. and he hits on kate throughout the party talking about how he knows uh the prince uh, prince charles and lady die yeah um and dexter is kind of just like wheeling around this party yeah he's you know pouring drinks and stuff and you know coming back to kate and then you know i mean that's what they do yeah you know they got everyone's gotta like make rounds kind of thing so they get home kate tells him that he was very good uh he unloads this gift bag full of elephants and one pig (laughs) and um kate starts packing a case yep he's like what are you doing Mm -hmm. she says well i'm leaving (laughs) yeah you know uh she figured out that he had sex with the woman Wade, and she explains she, it to him. Yeah, she's put it together from very small clues. Uh, well, when he poured her a drink, there was no talking. Right. And she didn't look at him. And she didn't say thank you. Yeah. She didn't say thank you. She just sort of, and then, yeah. 
Uh, but then she also pointed out, and we get some cut scenes back on how, like, when he mentions her name, he pauses, like he's accidentally going to let something out of the bag. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, so he has to reroute. Um, and then she tells him that the pig was from her. Ah. Mm-hmm. <sighs> well. And she leaves. She leaves. And he realizes that he is fucked up massively. He he has. Um, but the show goes on. Yeah. Right? This this <laughs> fucking Elephant Man musical is playing and playing and playing. Um we get sad Dexter. Yeah, we spend some time with Dexter and his sadness. And I love this because it's the classic movie trope where I- Yes. Everything reminds or is related to his misery. Everything on the TV and the radio is about infidelity. I'm all alone. Right. She walked out on me. I blew it. I crushed my love's mm-hmm. heart. Kind of shit. Yes. Every fucking where he goes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and then to cap it all off, he's getting ready for a show. Yes. And he sees on a, an awards program, right? Yeah, it's, it's, um, I don't think it's their actual theater awards. No, but some kind of theater awards. A name they gave it for a theater awards. Right. He sees that Ron is there with Kate. Mm -hmm. Kate's his date. And he literally abandons the show to find Kate, even though this, it was filmed like the day before the awards program, right? Right. He, yeah, he went, well, yeah, when he understood, because he's like, ah, boo, 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 no, no, no. And then someone mentions this was last night. Mm -hmm. So it's being re-televised. But he abandons the show to find Kate while in full makeup as the elephant man. Yep. Uh, Oh, and on his way out, he grabs Charlie. Yeah. And sticks him in the chair. (laughs) Yes. And he's like, you know, just, they'll never know the difference. (laughs) <laughs> even though charlie's like a full two and a half feet shorter than him yes uh, um so he bolts out and then we see him in ron's dressing room at the theater where ron does his little review mm-hmm. and uh ends up tying up ron and taking his car right and uh finds out from ron that they didn't have sex Right. She just like shut him down. Yeah. You know, uh, and then we have this very eighties manic drive through town. We end up with a police chase. <laughs> um, and I just wrapped it up that it all ends up with him getting to Kate and then things are patched up with some groveling and begging. Yeah. And we have, a uh, like the hospital patients chime in. Yeah. You know, it's, it's again, it's an eighties thing. Where, you know, the yes. the reality of the situation is totally blown away. You're like, oh, come on, give him another chance. Yeah. And we get this, like, cheesy, sweet ending music. Yeah. And it uh, all works out in the end. Yeah. Yeah. Dexter was forgiven and they move on. Mm-hmm. The end. The end. Close that book. Close that book. Yeah. Bam. Um, so. I just, because I have it right here in my notes. Go for it. I'm pointing to it, people. This movie, as we were talking about it, I was thinking, this is a weird genre of film. Not in the typical genre assignments that we have, but this is a type of film that I don't know that has had a name. And we're talking about like transition movies and stuff. And it didn't sound right. So I came up with, with, it's a tadpole movie. Yes. And when we came in from break, I typed that at the bottom of my notes so I wouldn't forget. And I wanted to call this a tadpole movie because um, this was, it was the end of the 80s. Really after this, all that weird montage and the music and all that shit vanished from filmmaking. Right, because it was... um... Well, we were coming into the 90s. We were getting into slightly more sophisticated romantic comedies and... um, Things that were a little more socially relevant. I, I say that with a lot of, uh, you know, no one was truly brave right away, but we got to it. But I call this a tadpole movie because it was the end. It gave us the end of one era, but it also introduced things that 
created tadpoles that weren't right away taken, right? They had to grow. So a lot of stuff, what happens in this movie set the tropes for movies like, um, uh, seriously, just had them in my head. I can't help you. Love Actually. Yes. Notting Hill, mm-hmm. right? Love those movies. If you watch those movies after having watched this, folks, you're going to see, oh, oh, yeah. Because a few things that happened in here hadn't happened in the 80s films, right? Yeah. They weren't as mature or sophisticated in their delivery. So that's they were tadpoles. It took a little while. But eventually, um, other films got the full grown, you know, frog, right? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's, it, it set the course for a lot of things. But, and, and, uh, Notting Hill. Yeah. Love actually, these are UK movies. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's some before that too. But by the time you get to those bad boys, I mean, it's like they took the stu- the nuggets from this movie and ran with it and they work. They do work. And they were taken into like American cinema as well. I can't even like rom coms are not my cup of tea. Right. Um, I'm looking up nineties romantic comedies to <laughs> refresh in my memory. Oh boy. Not not all easy comedies, but um <laughs> <laughs> uh and now like, Google's kinda weird. How about as good as it gets? Uh, that is a romantic comedy. Um, not in the same vein as this, though. There really are not a lot as I'm kind of looking through these. Um, we kind of blew the 90s as far as rom coms. Uh, maybe. Maybe. She's all that. I mean, there was a lot of like transforming people kind of romantic comedies. Yeah. That was a very much. Uh, the first one that popped up is Son-in-Law, which is just a fucking monstrosity. Well, this, I think 90s is where we came up with that horrible fucking word, dramedy. Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to think of the movie with Marissa Tomei and Christian Slater. I can't think of the name of it. It's, it's a, it's a romantic, it's a romance film. Um, God, it's not coming to me. Um, but anyway, it's, there's comedic moments in it mm-hmm. and it's kind of lighthearted, but then it gets super serious and it, it heavy. So it's not, it's not at mm. all like tall guy. I mean, I think it took the United States until like the two thousands to catch up with this kind of feel for a movie. Well, yeah, well, I think they're still trying to, to be um be honest yeah so i'm looking this one up because it's bugging me uh i gotta put my glasses on so so far away one of the things that i really love about this movie is like i think it's a really good lesson the very beginning of the movie where we get to know him it's a little cheesy and a little exposition-y, but we learn everything that we need to know about Dexter in under, like, two minutes. Untamed heart. Oh, okay. What are your thoughts on that? On um, what? What I literally just said. The introduction? Yeah. I I liked it. I like the voiceover. I like, um, this is an instance where it works. Yeah. Because it's a tale, right? We're being told a tale. And it's like old movies, you know, fantasy movies where, you know, a thousand years ago, children, this mummy woke up and stormed through the town. <laughs> <laughs> we fade to like the, the, the meat of the movie. Yeah. Right. Where we see the characters and the things happening. I like that kind of stuff. I think when it done, when it's done correctly, it works well. So the same kind of thing. I like that we're getting a representation of him. And it, it almost makes it feel more honest because he's telling us this story. 
mm-hmm. and we're seeing him at his worst. Well, yeah, it was right? like I said earlier, it was we learn everything that we could possibly need to know about him yes. in like two minutes. Right. But through the whole movie, you know, you remember mm-hmm. that he's telling this story. Right. And I, I, again, I think I like that connection because someone telling a story most certainly would be prone to omit those less than dazzling moments of their behavior or whatever. <laughs> right. Right. You know, um, it was just kind of cool thinking, you know, he's retelling this and boy, you know, he, he was a bit of a dick and he is kind of a, kind of a weird dude. <laughs> he really is a little out there and, you know, right. Making some bad choices. So yeah, I really liked it because it just set the tone and, you know, I enjoyed it. Well, I enjoyed it. <laughs> um, the the motion, very British filmmaking. Yeah, it's a lot of um stationary camera pan shots. Yes, and everything is constantly on the move. Right. The moments like where he's sitting on the bench talking to Charlie and then the blind guy shows up. That is like the longest stillness in the entire film, right? There's always something going on. When he's moping at home, we have new dudes running around, right? Or he goes in to have a talk with Carmen. We get like 10 seconds of him saying a line or two and her replying. And then a guy's fucking head pops up from under the covers or two sets of feet pop up from the other side of the covers. You know, there's always shit going on. It is never focused on two characters for dramatic impact. And then, you know, the rest of the world is put out. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. I like it too. You know, it, it, like everything else, it has to fit. Yeah. I think it fits in this story very much. Yeah. Let's talk about including colorful secondary and tertiary characters into your film. Yes. <laughs> are you going to roll with it? Well, there are a lot of them and they're all extremely charming uh, in this movie. And they're all immediately recognizable either by their looks or their behaviors. Right? Yes. So there is, he has a blind neighbor. Yes. Right? Who's, who's allergic to his guide dog. Yes. Who's allergic, who is the source of a lot of hilarity. Yes. Uh, but also like a source of some sage advice for him. Yes. Uh, we have Charlie who is like the stagehand who kind of follows him around from his job to his other job. And, you know. Yeah. We have a lot of the characters in the hospital. Yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, And they're all entirely unique and they all have their own voices. And that is not easy to do. No. Especially when you don't get, I mean, all of these characters have maybe a total of one to two minutes of screen time throughout the whole movie. You know what I mean? And they're distinct and memorable. Mm -hmm. It's again, it's a very British thing. Yes. And, and television. Because anyone who's ever grown up watching the Benny Hill show, I mean, it's all about him, right? So he's like the, the Ron Anderson. Sure. You know, but there's these uh, recurring characters, but then there's the people that, you know, are only in that one episode. And if they have any interaction with, with anyone who's speaking or they have a speaking part, it's not just some silly mundane little thing. You know, it's, it, it has like a whole body to it. Like you said, the, excuse me, the hospital, um, these patients. Yeah. Again, we don't have any backstory. We don't have anything. They don't have anything to do with anything. They just happen to fucking be there wearing, you know, uh, hospital gowns. But they have, yeah, their own voice. Mm -hmm. And they're like, up in it. Oh, yeah. And there's a lot of them through this. Oh, yeah. You know, and to the point where when you're watching it, you're thinking, huh, there's a lot of people in the background here how many of them are going to like come at me? <laughs> How many of them are going to like come to life and contribute something? Mm-hmm. You know, uh, it's just kind of a cool feel. It's a good energy. It is a good energy and it makes the world feel more real. 
Mm -hmm. if that makes sense. You know, because they're not just voiceless, you know, shadow faces. Yeah, or set dressing. Yeah. Yeah. They're their own thing. I mean, I would say my advice to make people in the background kind of feel more real is, you know, come up with a sentence for your backgroundy ex, you know, characters. If they were to have a line, what would their line be? Right. Yeah. And what do it just one. Right. I mean, yeah. And then kind of like building on that, if you need an extra or someone to say a line, right. Um, unless it's a line that's like, Here's your mail delivery or whatever. Um, you know, if they need to have an interaction that's kind of like a fun ina- interaction, one of the things that they do with these hospital patients is the hospital patients, like their line matters a lot. It tells you a lot about them as much as you can learn in a line. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> like, I think there's one and he is complaining to Kate about his stab wound or, or something. And she just turns and she's like, well, you, you know, went and robbed a store or whatever it was. Right. I can't remember exactly what the line was. Um, oh, uh, the one that she was really glib with and quick has a vacuum cleaner hose stuck in his ass. Oh, that's right. Yeah. That's the one. And he's listed in the credits as such. Man <laughs> with vacuum cleaner hose stuck in his ass. Right. I mean, you come up with the one or two lines to make them memorable because here's your mail delivery is incredibly boring. But the quick one in this like, hey, can I get a little medical attention? And she's like, you can wait. You're the one who decided to shove a vacuum cleaner up your ass. Exactly. (laughs) And and that's the thing is, is it (laughs) clear? Clearly we remember it Um, and they put it in the credits. But yeah, um, when writing characters, and I don't mean your protagonist and your antagonist and the heroes and stuff, all of these man number one, attendant number two, fucking nobody characters, you know, that are to help people pad their resume as they're looking for a part that has a name. Yeah. You know, the up and comings who are really trying. Uh, this is the shit they get when they go out. Well. You know, we all know that. Yeah. I mean, yeah. You know, what do you, what do you do? I mean, talk to. You know, Kyle Hester was, you know, did extras, did fucking set work Mm -hmm. before he was able to finally be an actor, right? Yeah. You know, it happens. Well, I like kind of you bringing up, you know, attendant number one, attendant attendant number two. It's in all the like script writing books. Give them names if you can, even if their name isn't put up on there. And you can even say like, Sean, the attendant. If you can and I agree with you, but you also have to be very, you have to put in the, you know, the word of caution. You can lose selling your script to somebody if they read it and there's so many names. Right. Right. So here's a good example. Um, let's take like, uh, let's take like an episode of The Walking Dead, mm-hmm. like mid season, blow it up into a, a two hour film. There's a lot of fucking main characters in there. Right. And it's height. They had like 13 people who you had to have the names straight. Right. Now, if you're trying to sell this script, someone's trying to follow what you're writing. And then you start throwing in, you know, instead of, uh, you know, like wall guard number one, wall guard number two, you've got Tom and Bob. Well, who the fuck are Tom and Bob now? You, know? <laughs> you see what I mean? They look for that kind of stuff. So it's kind of a balance. But you should at the very least think of them as with a name because that like makes them real. You know, it's like Silicon Valley. (laughs) Say your name. It forces them to see it was human. Yeah. So, you know, um, because we've done it, man one, man two. Yeah. Because it's like this is such a nothing thing and we have so many other things going on. But I mean, I think an easy way to do it is to say, so it's a waiter, right? The waiter, you could say, <clears throat> I'm sorry, you could say, you know, Claire, the waitress. I was just going to say, yeah, Claire, the waitress, John, the waiter. Yeah. You you can, we have in, in, in our zombie uh, sequel, we have a magnificent name. Alms. Alms. We'll just leave it at that. That's, that's an abbreviation we gave him. Yeah. 
And we named, MS. we named all the zombies mm. ridiculous names. <laughs> yes. Cause we thought, and well, even in the first one, our, our dream team has, you know. Yeah. They have names. Yeah. Um, we named our zombies, man. Yeah. And it's not Fred, Gina, Tom, and, no. and Florence. No. They have descriptive names. Yes, they do. Uh, and fun ones. Mm-hmm. Uh, as a writer, folks, when you're writing, fucking do however you want. Yeah. That's, I think, kind of the thing. So, yeah, you know, it's Claire the waitress. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, John the gas attendant. Uh, you know, if you want to kind of like have a little fun, you can do, you know, uh, uh, Kevin, the convenience store clerk. <laughs> sure. You know, maybe Kevin Smith will see your movie one day, sit through the credits and go, I wonder if that's me. Call you up. You can tell him, God damn right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, it's all about I mean, having fun. Yeah. You know, this movie was fun. I, I would love to sit with one of these writers when they're coming up with something like this, just to see the fun they have. Right. Doing it. Because I think that's something we forget. I think it is too. You know, this is supposed to be fun. Yeah. Whether or not you live and breathe with it by as a business, as your sole source of income, or your one day you want to have income, um, you need to remember this is supposed to be fun. Because the second it's not is that the next second you need to go. Yeah. You know, it's hard. It can be frustrating, can be angering, but under there always is that underlying thing of, I do this because it's fun. I do this because it's fun. Right. Because I love it. And this is part of the process and it'll pass. There is, um, for people who watch the show, Ted Lasso. Yeah. There is an episode where the captain of the soccer team is having a rough time. And so the coach takes him to go visit the former captain. And the former captain takes him to his old playing field and basically just like shoves him out there with this kind of like rough and tumble, you know. But just a bunch of like neighborhood kids. Right. Neighborhood kids. Yeah. Older neighborhood kids. Yeah. But yeah. And he's like getting tackled and stuff. And so he goes up to the, you know, the older captain and he's like, what are you? Why did you? I'm going to get hurt. Why did you put me out here? Mm -hmm. And the captain's like. So that you can remember that you used to do this for fun. It's yeah. a game. Have it's, fun. Yeah. We got to remember it was Roy Kent. So yes. it's more like, you know, it's a fucking game. <laughs> <laughs> Have fun. <laughs> Have fun. <laughs> you know, you used to come out here every day after school or, you know, during the daytime and now this and play and you used to get your ass kicked and you get back up and play and you'd be back here the next fucking day. And then one day you got picked to play on a professional team. What changed? Right. right. When did you stop having fun? Yeah. Yeah. And then that, of course. Uh, yeah. That's his aha moment. And, you know, some people, when they see that movie, they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I saw that coming. Yeah. But you know how true it is? You can call it true. I have to remind mm-hmm. myself about things that I think are fun. You know, when they get to the point where they feel like work. Well, that's the thing is it's not a hobby. A hobby is only ever supposed to be fun. Yeah. If a hobby ever feels like work, people abandon it mm-hmm. completely. What we're doing is work. Yeah. I mean, it's not just writing. We could sit here and write 10,000 scripts, but we're also engaged in the part of trying to get those out to people, meeting people. This is, it is a soul sucking life draining business, but at the end of the day, still have fun. Yeah. Even with the disappointments and with, you know, successes, it's even better. But yeah. either one, we still have fun because this is what we were meant to do. Mm-hmm. And this is what we do. And we met all these wonderful people. We, we, you know, got things going and it's just great, you know. Um, but it's a lot of disappointment and no's and stuff, but that's part of the fun. You have to buy into that. Yes. You do. You know, um, painting figures. You oh, like, yeah. That's fun. You love painting figures. I do. But when it gets to be like. <sighs> oh, then well, I stop. Like you, you bought, we bought a bunch of them and you were like marathon painting. Yeah. I'm going to get these done before we play. One, two, three, four, five, six. I have fun doing nine, it. 11, 12. But then one night you're like, I, you know what? Mm, <laughs> I think I've done enough. 
it's 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 just starting to aggravate me because mm-hmm. there's like a sameness and I don't want to have to think about how to do this one different and just I'm done. Doesn't mean you quit, quit right? Away. But you it put it, not doing it right yeah, now. You put it away. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, now, if that were this though, that were a pursuit. Yeah. You don't do that. Right. You find the fun in the challenge. You know. Like our current project, that is a challenge. A little bit. Yeah. But we'll get there. We yeah, are. We'll, we'll get there. We will. We have never once picked anything easy. I know. You know, we see these people, I love it. We see these success stories of people who are like, oh, I wrote this script and, you know, so I had to do some research and then next door to me lived the guy who did the actual thing with his cousin and his cousin was the guy who was the friend of the brother. So I got him to call me and then like over a weekend, I got all this stuff and bam, got a script. We watch those and we're like, you know, hey, that's awesome, man. That's that's like, you know, the fucking lottery win, <laughs> right? Meanwhile, we pick projects where it's like everyone's been dead for a thousand years. I know. You know, and they came from a different planet and, you know, they speak a different language and it wasn't written. So they, they, you know, how do you figure it out? Well, we have to try and meditate and it's, oh my God, it's just all this ridiculous, long winded. Mm-hmm. <sighs> but well, we do I it. mean, we're putting in records requests and we're essentially getting told, well, you can come over here and look through. And, you know, they mean, by come over here, they mean, to England. So. Right. So, yeah, we put in a records request uh, in England. Um, the, the records that we want, we requested are so old, it's out of the purview of the London police. Yeah. Uh, yeah and Scotland Yard and the whole thing. So, we need to, <laughs> we need to petition a minister, uh, one of the MPs, mm-hmm. for sponsorship for a formal request to the federal government for these records, which may or may not exist. Right. right? So we both decided, well, that train stops here. (laughs) (laughs) We will no longer be embarking on that particular journey uh, because it's a whole to do. We'll find other avenues to research. We have avenues. Here's the thing. We are like 70%. We have what we need. Mm-hmm. It's that last 30% though that can make or break a story. Yeah. Kind of like right? when you're, you know, loading a program onto your computer. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay. So Just I've, swimmingly up until the end there. I've read enough books about various, era, you know, things that went on in World War II because that was just a huge fascination with me. Right. Mm-hmm. We could do a World War II script based on what I know. However, There will be some inconsistencies, some slight inaccuracies, date issues, terminology issues, right? You know, and and we would never do that because that's my biggest bitch. Listeners, you know this. Newcomers, get used to it. My biggest bitch is know what you're writing about. Yeah. If you don't know, take the time to research it because that's the quickest call out to a viewer. Um, And I've always used for it because I'm a priest. So anytime someone does anything with religion, I can immediately call out, oh, crud. they didn't even bother with that one, yeah. you know. Um, but we want to give credit to the story by being as accurate as we can. And the sources of information that we're pursuing are not news clippings, not in books. Right. Right. This is stuff that it's tangible but it's sort of borderline ethereal. Yeah. And, but it's what's going to make it a thousand times better. Well, the sto- it deserves the work that is being put into it is what I'm going to say. It does. I mean, it, it deserves to be as, I don't know, as good as it can be. And it can always be better when you have more information. Yeah. So the tall guy, if you can find it, folks, watch it. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, Jeff Goldblum. It's funny. Uh, we just had Lily watch the fly. I know. We watched another Jeff Goldblum movie yeah. this week. We're getting Jeff Goldblum well, all be, up in our faces. Well, because of our hundredth episode, um, and Ryan Kruger, that was his, yeah. his movie, you know? And so we told her about it and we discussed it. And we're like, Oh yeah, she can watch this. And she's 12. Um, and she's like, Jeff Goldblum, I'm sold. 
Everybody loves, she loves him. him. Yeah. He, she, she goes, he's just so beautiful. And then when, and when the movie started, she goes, look at his hair. <laughs> it is magnificent. It's <laughs> great. Anyway. Um, so see this and, uh, enjoy revel and, uh, join me in the birth of a movie expression for this tadpole film. Yeah. That spawned other tadpole films. I was just looking to see if it is available on any streaming services. And according to this website, <clears throat> which is TV Guide, because you can look and see if it's on any streaming services. Right. It says, loading, please wait. Okay. But it said that for the last, like, three minutes. So. <laughs> um, yeah. When, see, this is what I'm talking about. It'd be awesome to have a watch party. Mm, yeah. We couldn't do it in public, but you know. Anyway. So, The Siders. Watch it. Yeah. And then head out to our own website. www.lordsofmisrollproductions.com. Oh my God. Killing it. You just killed it. I know. I nailed it. <laughs> sure. Okay. I'm awesome <laughs> um all our stuff is there everything is there uh and there's gonna be some more stuff there once i get the uh observations of earth with bf mcgillicuddy i'm deciding whether or not to have it as its own page or to put it under our projects Blah, projects page and our youtube link takes us to the podcast i could do another one i suppose for mcgillicuddy i don't know Got a little work to do. Hey, by the time you're listening to this, folks, I may have had all that shit sorted out. He'll have figured it out. This still says loading. Please wait. It'll never show up anywhere on any streaming service. And if you want to make some eight-digit bids on our copy of The Tall Guy, go ahead and scroll down the page and find those email links and shoot us a note. Uh, email us. Check out our social media pages. Check out all our stuff. Merch site. Patreon. All the stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, check out the people we follow on social media because they're cool and you should follow them too. Yep. And uh, as always, got things in the works coming up. So can't say what they are. Nothing's locked down yet. Plus, we like to keep shit as a surprise. So yeah. There you go. Mm-hmm. All right. All right. Well. Hey, you know what? What? I'm just going to do this. Just because we never hit these buttons on our boards. Our mine's not even set up. I know. Breaks my heart. That's all right. Though. I set it up when I plan to use sound clips, which isn't often. But anyway. Well, this is supposed to be like inspirational. B-siders. <laughs> Until next week. Keep creating. Keep a mask on. Keep a mask on. Get your shots. Yeah. Ugh. Don't. You know. Don't. Don't take ivermectin. You're not an equine being. Yeah. You ain't no horse. Just do it the people way. Yeah. All right. Anyway. You were saying. Oh, until next time is what I was saying. Yeah. Uh, this is Danny, a hopeless romantic. And this is Jim. Arguably the more romantic one in our relationship. I'm not going to comment <laughs> This will be out there forever. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> love you. And B-Siders, I love you too. Reach out to us. Let's do this more and more and more, folks. Catch you next week. All right.